Are y'all ready to get into it? All right, listen, this morning we are going to do some scriptural gymnastics. And what I mean by that is I've got a lot of territory to cover, uh, and I'm almost going to suggest just give up on your Bible and look at the screens because I'm going to be going so fast you won't have time to find it. Uh, Today is a very, for me, a very exciting text because we're going to watch the Word and the Spirit come together in the midst of an event that happened in the desert. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the people of Israel leaving Egypt, uh, leaving that bondage, going out into the desert territory, uh, and, and, and running out of water. Running out of water. In Exodus 17, 5 through 7, it looks like this. Then the Lord said to Moses, pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand a staff, the one which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. By the way, Horeb means desert. And you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he named the place Masa and Meribah. Guess what Masa and Meribah mean? Temptation and strife. He named it Masa and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? So here we have our first uh, issue with water. We are at a place, we have no water. They are quarreling because they have no water. And the Lord says, look, Moses, take the staff which we know to be the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. I want you to take that staff. I want you to go to this rock. I want you to strike that rock and water will flow from that rock. But then we jump over to the book of Numbers and there's a second occurrence of this happening in Numbers 20. This is a different time, not a a recapturing of the same event. Numbers 28 through 3. Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, assemble the congregation. Now watch. Speak to the rock before their eyes that it may yield its water and thus bring forth water for them out of the rock and let the congregation and their beasts drink. So Moses took the rod before the Lord just as he commanded him and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock and he said to them, listen now you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And water came forth abundantly, and the congregation and their beasts drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you have not believed in me, to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Those were the waters of Meribah, because the sons of Israel contend with the Lord, and he proved himself holy among them. So here we have two scenarios where Moses is supposed to draw water from a rock. And the first one, he's told, strike the rock, and he does. And the second one, he's told, speak to the rock, and instead he strikes it. Now, I'm going to jump right into what we're talking about today, because it's in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under one cloud and passed through one sea. We're talking about the Israelites in the desert. And we're all baptized in the Moses, in the cloud, and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Jesus. So now we have our first parallel of what's going on. There was a rock in the desert that water came from, and Paul is saying, hey, that rock in the desert was Jesus. So what do we do with that? First of all, let's take some of the more obvious things. Moses strikes the rock the first time. The second time, he's told to speak to it, but he strikes it again twice, and then he's punished for that. And we think... How mean is God? You know, he struck it the first time. Why couldn't he strike it the second time? Just because he told him to speak to it. Listen, you just heard the reason why God punished Moses. Um, Why? Because it's a reference to Christ. 
And Christ was stricken for us, Isaiah 53, 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But listen to me, he only, Jesus, only had to be stricken and smitten by God once. Hebrews 10.10, but by this we have all been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Christ has been crucified once for all. There is never a need, hear me out, for him to be stricken and smitten of God again. This is why Moses is in trouble because God says that rock is Jesus. It should be struck one time only and you struck it twice. Therefore, I'll find a new leader to take him into the promised land. Ouch. Ouch. But maybe now it makes more sense because God is saying that was Jesus. That was the rock. And you're trying to show people it needs to be stricken more than once. Oh, it should have been spoken to the next time. I'll show you in a minute what I mean. So there is now water flowing from this rock because whether he spoke or struck, God let the water flow from the rock. And if this rock is Jesus, then what is this water that's flowing from the rock? What does it represent? We go to John chapter 7, New Testament, verse 37. Now on the last day of the great feast, Jesus stood up and cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Then he explains it. But this he spoke of the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not given yet because Jesus was not glorified yet. So let me make some points here. Jesus is the rock. He says, come to me and drink. The living water that you drink is the Holy Spirit. The living water was not flowing yet in this scripture because Jesus had not been glorified. That's what he said. So what does it mean to be glorified? Jesus has to be glorified. It's his crucifixion and resurrection. We get that in John 12, 23. And Jesus answered to them saying, the hour has not come for this. I mean, see, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So hear me out. If Jesus dies, if he has stricken, the water of the Holy Spirit will flow out of him. Let me say it this way. When the rock absorbs the wrath of God, the water of the Holy Spirit flows out. Oh, let me say that again. When the rock absorbs the wrath of God, the water of the Holy Spirit will flow out. So we have a confirmation that Moses was supposed to speak to the rock on the second occasion in Luke eleven thirteen. 13. If then, being evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Holy Spirit, the river of living water, now comes when you ask, Romans 10, 13. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So now we understand the full parallel. Christ is stricken once only. From then on, we got to call on him. We got to speak for those waters to flow. But there's another interesting parallel from the Old Testament about water coming from the rock. I want to show this to you. It's in Psalm 78, 15. It says, He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them abundant drink like the ocean depths. It's repeated in Isaiah 48, 21. They did not thirst when he led them to the desert. He made the water flow out of the rock for them. Watch the words. He split the rock and the water gushed forth. Now we have the analogy that the rock had to be split for the water to flow. He split the rock so that the water would flow. 
So here's where New Testament scriptures all of a sudden have a different meaning than we thought, maybe more of a meaning than we recognized. If the rock is Jesus and the rock was split, and when he was split, water came out, doesn't this scripture at the crucifixion make more sense? John 19, 34, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. I don't know if you see it, but I see two things. The blood for salvation comes forth when he is struck with the spear and the water of the Holy Spirit comes out of the split rock Jesus. Are you okay if we go deeper with the analogy? Okay, so at this cataclysmic moment in history when Jesus is crucified, something else is happening at that same time. Matthew 27, 50 and 51. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit. We know he's on the cross. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Now, I'm just asking you, when Jesus is crucified on a cross, why do we need to know that the curtain over in the temple splits in two and rocks break in half? What's the point of knowing? This is huge. First, I want to talk about the veil. The veil was the separation between the holy of holies where God met with the uh, with Moses and with the high priest and the holies. The holies is where the priest would come in and they would take out the show bread and they would light the candles and they would put incense. It's an offering up to God in prayer, but they could not go beyond the veil. And you had to go through a whole process to be cleansed, to go beyond the veil. And the high priest could only do it once a year after being cleansed. Then he could go in before God. And then and, and when Jesus is crucified, this veil in the temple tears from the top to the bottom. And most people will teach you that what that represents is now the veil is torn so that we can enter into the holy holies where God is. I've never seen it that way. I don't see it that way in scripture. See, what I see in scripture is that veil is torn to release the spirit of God into the people. Oh, I want you to hear me out. God never had a desire once the veil was torn for man to go back to the temple and go through the veil into the Holy of Holies. No, he was releasing the Holy Spirit to enter its new temple. Do you not know, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, that you are the temple of God and God's Spirit dwells in you? It doesn't dwell in the temple anymore. The veil was split. It came out of the temple and entered into the believers. God tears the veil to release his Spirit to the believers. So now the Holy Spirit, stay with me, is being released from the temple. His spirit is poured forth from the temple to the believer. Now listen, the veil was torn and the rocks split. The rocks split so that the water of the Holy Spirit could be poured out from the temple. So maybe this scripture comes to life now in Titus 3. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit who he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior so that being justified by his grace we would be heirs according to the eternal hope of eternal life. I don't know if you're getting the picture. Jesus is glorified now in his crucifixion. The veil is torn. The rocks are split so that the water of the Holy Spirit can go out to the people. And Jesus says that that flow of water brings life. Mm. When does that life that that water brings happen? John 7. Now, on the last day, we read this already, the great day of the feast, Jesus couldn't stood and cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his inmost being will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke this of the spirit. When you believe the rivers of living water that come from the rock enter you, and now that begins to flow from you. 
Why? Because we're now the temple and the veil has been torn and the, rip, uh, the rocks are split and it's time for the Holy Spirit to flow. Uh, I'm not done yet. I'm not done because now I'm going to go back to the Old Testament and I'm going to show you a story and you're going to say, why did we not see that? So we know that Jesus, when he returns, if you go to Israel, there's a temple mound. That temple mound has a eastern gate. And through that eastern gate is the Kidron Valley, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, and beyond that, the Dead Sea. And we know that Jesus is going to return through that eastern gate. That's what Scripture tells us. I'm going to go to Zechariah 14, 1 through 8. Stay with me. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil, uh, when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city will be captured and houses plundered and women's ravished and half of the city exiled. But the rest of the people will be not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against the nations as he fights on the day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will be moved toward the north and half of it toward the south. And you'll flee by the valley to my mountains for the valley of the mountains will reach over Azel. Yes, you'll flee. And as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uriah and the king of Judah, then the Lord my God will come and all of his holy ones with him. And in that day, there'll be no light and luminaries will dwindle for it will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither by day nor night, but it will come about that evening time. There will be light. Now, Watch, verse 8, and in that day, that day when Jesus comes, splits the Mount of Olives, and it divides. When the rock splits, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and the other half toward the western sea, and it will be summer as well. And I don't know if you're seeing this, but the rocks are splitting and water is coming out of the temple. Oh, but wait, there's more. Because that picture seems to fit Ezekiel 47. So let's go to Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47, you know the story about the water coming from the temple and getting deeper and deeper and deeper. It speaks of the millennial reign of the returning Christ. And it says, then he brought me back to the door of the house, interpreted as temple. And behold, water was flowing from under the threshold. What's under the threshold? The foundation of the house toward the east. Uh, Water was flowing from the rock toward the east. And the house faced east, and the water was flowing down from under, from the right side of the house, from south of the altar. Stay with me. The water comes from the foundation stone to the altar flowing outward to the east. He brought me out by way of the north gate, and he led me around to the outside of the gate by the way of the gate that faces east. And behold, water was trickling from the south side, and when the man went out toward the east with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubics, and he led me through the water, and the water reaches the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand, he led me through the water, and the water reaches the knees. And and he measured a thousand, he led me through the water, and the water reaching the loins. And again, he measured a thousand, the river which I could not ford, for the water had risen enough for this water to swim in, and a river that could not be forded. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me back to the bank of the river. Now when I returned, behold, on the bank of the river, there were many trees on one side and on the other. And then he said to me, these waters go out toward the eastern region and go down to Arabah. And they go toward the sea, talking about the Dead Sea. Being made to flow into the sea, the waters of the sea become fresh. The Dead Sea is salt water. And he's saying the water that's coming out of the temple is flowing to the Dead Sea and making the Dead Sea fresh water. It will come about that every living creature which swarms in every place where the river goes will live. Oh, let me say it. Where the water goes, there will be life. 
And there will be very many fish, for those waters will go and others will come fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. And it will come about that fishermen will stand beside it from the Engedi to Englam. There will be a place for the spreading of their nets. Their fish will be according to their kinds. It's like the fish of the great sea, very many. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They'll be left for salt. For the river on its banks on one side and the other will grow all kinds of trees for food. The leaves will not wither, nor the fruit will not fail. They will bear every month because of their water, because their water flows from the sanctuary, the holy place, and their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Water, the Holy Spirit, coming from the sanctuary in the temple, will give life and give healing. Jesus splits the Mount of Olives and the water of the Holy Spirit flows from Jerusalem to the east and brings life to all who swim in its waters. I don't know if you know this, but the Mount of Olives is on the east side of the Temple Mound. It's divided by the Kidron Valley. Why is Jesus splitting the Mount of Olives? So that the water that flows from the temple can make it to the Dead Sea and turn salt water to fresh. Come on. This is all a picture of Christ and how the Holy Spirit comes from Christ once he is stricken. Once he's stricken in the desert, he is split to provide water. Once the rocks at the temple were split so the Holy Spirit can be poured out at his crucifixion, and then we have Jesus return to split the mountain of olives and the Spirit flowed out of him from the temple mound. It's an amazing connection all the way through the scripture that when you split the rock, you get the Holy Spirit. And when the rock was already split at Calvary, we now have living waters that flow to us so the Holy Spirit can dwell in us and those waters can flow from us. Who? I told you I would cut it short. Keep going or cut it short? Cool. All right, I want to clarify for you with that in mind. Jesus is the rock. Everybody say that. Jesus is the rock. He's the rock in the desert. He's the rock at the temple. He's the foundation of Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit is poured out from the rock. And then there's this scripture in Matthew 16. God bless you, love you, raised, born, maybe still Catholic. Stay with me. <laughs> Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he said to them, Who do you say that I am, disciples? And Simon Peter answered, said, You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. But my father who's in heaven, I love Jesus in these moments because I would love to go back and hear how that was delivered because I think it was one of those, for that to come out of you, Simon, that had to be from the Lord. <laughs> I also say to you that you're Peter. And upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loosed on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And so many people have taught, uh, been taught that Jesus was going to build his church on Peter, upon Peter as the first pope. And they use this scripture. And part of the confusion is Peter's name. Because Peter's name is Petros and it means a stone. And they say, Jesus was saying upon this rock that is Peter, the stone, I'm going to build my church. But what is the rock that Jesus is building on? Who is the rock? Jesus. The statement Peter made was, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And don't miss the fact that Jesus' name has been identified. So he turns and say, yep, and you are Peter, but upon this rock, I will build my church. What he's saying to Peter is, you may be a stone, but my name is the Christ, the son of the living God. I am the chief cornerstone. I am the sure foundation. I am the stone the builders rejected. I am the rock of offense. I am the rock that living waters flow from. So you may be a stone, Peter, but I'm going to build it on my name. Yeah. 
If you need proof, go to Matthew 27, 24. Therefore, every man who hears these words of mine and acts on them, may he be compared to the wise man who built his house on the rock, not on Peter, on the rock. Psalm 62, he only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will, shall not be greatly shaken. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. Verse seven, oh, on God, my salvation and my glory rest. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Consider this in Matthew 16, 15, when he's talking to Peter and he says, you may be a stone, but on the rock, I'm going to build my church. The very next verse. I'm not kidding. He has that conversation with Peter in 15 through 20 of chapter 16. In 21 through 23, he looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. I'd say Peter's not doing too well as the first pope. The rock is Jesus. And he has built his church on the fact that once stricken, the Holy Spirit can flow. And he provides that to you and I. He is saying to you this morning, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his inmost being will flow rivers of living water. And this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. Jesus is the rock and the Holy Spirit flows from him. This is why Jesus tells us in John 16, I am going back to sit at the right hand of the father at the throne, but I will not leave you alone. I will give you the Holy Spirit. Listen, and he, the Holy Spirit, and he will guide you into all truth. It's, ah, uh, I could get on to this. I don't know if I should do this, but listen to me. Here was the change in me personally. When I went to Bogota, the man said, the Holy Spirit is supposed to guide you into truth. Who are you being led by? I'm from the United States. I said, Jesus. And he said, then you're disobeying Jesus because he told you to follow the Holy Spirit. Ow. See, what's happening in the U.S. churches, I don't know why I'm on this, what's happening in the U.S. churches is we become so Jesus-centric that it keeps us away from the Holy Spirit. Here's what we're saying. I heard it said this past weekend, well, the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus, so just follow Jesus. But Jesus said, follow the Holy Spirit. So we got to be comfortable saying, I know the Spirit of God. I am following the Spirit of God. He is leading me and guiding me into truth. He has empowered me. I didn't come with words of persuasion uh, and, and, and beautiful doctrine. I came to you with a demonstration of the power of the Spirit so we can change lives. We must be comfortable with the Holy Spirit. Coming from... Is that Andrew? Hey, Andrew. That man right there is a pastor in Medellin, Colombia. I'm glad you're here, buddy. Hey, come on. That's... So here's what I want to say to you today, because I think there are people who are sitting here and this is what they're thinking. Yeah, those crazy charismatic people, they talk about the Holy Spirit all the time. They say the Holy Spirit speaks to them. They say the Holy Spirit guides them. I don't ever get that kind of thing going on. Listen to me. Jesus was stricken and smitten of God. He absorbed the wrath of God so that you could experience the Holy Spirit. How does that work? It works like this. God created us. He created man. Listen, you can play evolution all day long, but you will never explain male and female in evolution. Cannot be done. It doesn't make sense in survival of the fittest or environmental adaptation to create two things that are kind of like each other that then have to give something to the other one to create something else that's like them, but different, that needs something. That's not how evolution would do it. Evolution would say, I need to stand on my own. I need to duplicate myself. But God said, I created them male and female. He created you and he gave us this earth to enjoy. He said, it's yours. I put you in a garden. Here, enjoy all of the fruit, but don't eat from this tree. And people would say, why did he do that? Why did he put the tree in there to give us an opportunity to fail? Because you can't love something without a choice. I love that woman. It's my choice to love that woman. There are other women here I could love, but I choose this one. This is the one I love. 
Do you know what that says to her? He chose me. Not because that's a great thing to have Todd love you, but he chose. (laughs) And God is doing the same thing. Will you choose me? Because if you choose me, I will give you life. I will give it to you abundantly. I'll give you every truth. Satan comes into the garden. Satan comes in and says, did he tell you you would die if you ate from that tree? And he said, yeah, if we eat from this one, we're going to die. Now listen, if you haven't figured it out, they did eat from the tree and they didn't drop dead. Why? Is God's word not true? No, his word is very true. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says the whole of a man is his body, soul, and spirit. His body didn't die in the garden. His soul didn't die. He still knew he had to leave the garden. He still knew he could have kids. He still could. He was still thinking and operating. Adam and Eve both were. But in the spirit, his spirit was dead because of sin. What is death in scripture? Separation from God. His spirit became separate. What actually happened when Eve took of that tree? She said, I don't want what God has to offer. I want what Satan is offering. And so she left the presence of God and joined to the demonic. She was deceived, by the way. Adam, her husband, sinned. He knew it was wrong. He did it anyways. Suck it up, men. So now they're separated from God. He says, you got to leave the garden. You can no longer be in the garden. That's where I take care of you. You've chosen Satan. He can take care of you outside in the garden, but I don't want to leave it that way. So I'm going to send my son and he's going to come to this earth and he's going to walk it without sin. Why would that be important that he walked without sin? Because he was never separated from God. He never did anything that would break his relationship with God. In other words, when he dies, he can go spend an eternity with God. While when Adam and Eve died, they're dying in their sin. They're going to go spend an eternity with Satan. But Jesus comes and he lives a life without sin. The scripture says, he who knew no sin became sin so that, everybody say so that. So that I might become the righteousness of God. I might become into right standing with God through Jesus. I get back into right standing with God through what Jesus did. What did Jesus do? He took my condemnation. He took my punishment for my sin. I have sinned. If you are a parent, you know you cannot allow your child to continue to disobey you. Why? because it's not good for them. So God says, I'm going to send my son. He's going to live it out perfect, never separating himself from me, always in good relationship with me, good to go. But you know what he's going to do? He's going to go to a cross and he's going to bear the sin of all mankind. He's going to take the sin upon himself so that he could die. Why is that important? Because one day I'm going to stand before God. And I'm going to stand there in one of two ways. One way, I'm going to stand there and try to convince him I've been good. Man, I pastored a church. Man, we had a river of life flowing in our field. Man, I prayed. I read scripture. 18 times, there was somebody on the corner that needed money, and I gave it to him. And he's going to say, did you ever sin? And I'm going to say, yeah. He said, then you're separated from me without Jesus. But Jesus took all of your condemnation, all of your punishment on himself so that you could be right with the Father. How does that work for you and I? The scripture says we have to believe. What do I have to believe? I have to believe that I have sinned and separated myself from God, that my eternity isn't with God in sin. Then I have to believe that Christ came and lived out this perfect life and died in my place. He took the condemnation and punishment on the cross. Listen to me. He cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he became separated from God, bearing my sin. And he died. And if they'd have put him in a tomb and he'd have stayed there, he'd have just been some nice prophet who did miraculous things that told a good story but the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. Why? To show you and I that there is an everlasting life and he can give it to us. If you were willing, if you are willing to believe this morning that you are separated by God from God because of your sin, but that Christ would die for you, if you would believe he did that for you, he took the condemnation and punishment on the cross in my place. I believe he did that. He becomes my savior. Listen, this is what happens. You just accepted what happened at the cross, and now the rock is flowing living waters into you. 
Oh. You might be here this morning and you're saying, I've never heard from the Holy Spirit. I don't hear about those things. I don't, I don't have guidance from God. Maybe it's time to consider, do you know him? Have you accepted what Christ has done? Scripture says to repent. What's repent? It's changing my mind. It's believing something different than I believe. See, what I used to believe is that if I went to church and I was a good person and I did more good things than bad things, that I could go to heaven. But Scripture says if I've just done one thing wrong, I've separated myself from God. So now I'm going to believe that I can't on my own merits. Listen, all have sinned. That's it. That's all of us and fallen short of the glory of God. I can't get there on my own. I can't do this in my own efforts and my own works. I have to trust in what Christ did on the cross, that he did it to me. When I put my belief and my faith in that, then Christ sends me the Holy Spirit to dwell in me, and I begin that walk and that conversation. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for just a moment, because I believe there's someone in here today that this is revelation for, that it finally makes sense why I need what Jesus did on the cross, that on the cross, he actually died and paid the punishment for my sin. And I want you to hear me out. Christ is willing right now to accept you into the family of God by putting your belief that he did that for you. And I want to tell you something that may shock you. You're going to wonder if I accept him today and I sin tomorrow, am I separated again? I want you to hear really closely what I'm about to say. When Christ died for your sins and the sin of all mankind, he did it before you and I were born. In other words, he's already died for your life of sin. So some would say, well, then is it okay if I continue in sin since I've saved? Listen to me. He's going to send you his spirit and his spirit will give you the desires of your heart. That does not mean a nice car in the driveway. It means he's going to give you new desires in your heart. You're going to seek and want righteousness. You're going to look for him. You're going to look to please him and walk in his ways. And that life of sin will be laid behind you as you take on a walk in the spirit. Those who walk by the spirit, these are the children of God. Would you be willing to say, I need him today? I need to accept Christ and what he did on the cross for me, that he died for my sin, that he was resurrected to show me eternal life, that it'd be just as if I'd never sinned because I believe in him as my savior. I'm inviting the Holy Spirit to come and fill me up. I want to walk by the spirit. I want to get out of the flesh. I want to see things in the spiritual realm and walk in the ways of God. You can do that right now. Maybe you just go to God in this moment. You say, God, I get it now. I, I have sinned. I am separated from you. But this morning, I believe that Jesus did that on the cross for me. I believe he was taking my punishment on the cross. I believe he came out of that grave to show me that there's an eternal life with God if I would be submitted to God instead of to the enemy because I'm going to spend my eternity with whoever I'm submitted to. And today I want to submit my life to God. Enter that family through Jesus and what he's done on the cross for me. Be forgiven and walk out of here filled with the Holy Spirit, ready to walk a new abundant life. Thank you, God. Thank you for that. With your eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. The scripture says that all of heaven rejoices when one comes to know their need for salvation. And I'm just that guy that wants to know if there's a party going on in heaven. If you're here this morning, this is you and me. That's why I've got everybody's eyes closed because this is before you and the Father. And if you've accepted what Christ has done for you today, you will confess him as your Lord. I'm just going to ask you to do this between you and me. If today it finally made sense and you accepted Christ as your Savior this morning, you're ready to receive the Holy Spirit. Would well, you just raise your hand? Say, that was me today. I got it. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Now I want you to hear me out. I want you to hear me out. If that was you this morning, if you said, you know what, I need what Jesus did for me because I can't make it on my own. I need to know that he died for me and he's offering that to me. I'm accepting that this morning. Listen, what happened is you just got eternally forgiven.
God has now said, I'm going to make you the home of the Holy Spirit. You're going to host the Holy Spirit. He's going to be guiding you, talking with you. He's going to be setting a path for you. He's going to begin that beautiful conviction problem. He's going to convict you that you're righteous. It's a beautiful thing, but you have joined a family here. A lot of us have already made this decision. We understand what it means to walk this out. So we're going to be here from If you have questions, ask. There are people here waiting to answer your questions. This is what I want to do to end this morning. I want you to stand to your feet. We talked about rivers of living water flowing from the believer. Christ said, you drink of me and living waters will flow out of you. Here's what I'm asking this morning. Do you see that fruit in your life? Do you see the fruit of living waters pouring out of you? Do you see the gospel pouring out of you? Do you see healing pouring out of you? Do you see joy? Do you see peace? Do you see rejoicing flowing out of you? No? Hey, we all go through seasons, but this is what I think we need to do this morning. We need to open up our hands and ask the Holy Spirit, would you come and rain on me? Would you drench me? Would you let living waters pour out from me this morning? Maybe this is your first time to ask for this, or maybe you understand what we're doing, but we're asking for a fresh baptism in the Spirit. We're asking the Holy Spirit just move and flow through us. So I just want you to lift up your voices this morning and proclaim, my hands are open. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.